Be careful of your emails and more. This week on ThreatWire. Email security was trending this week, specifically a new kind of email phish attack, as well as malware and emails. On March 31st, Luta Security posted an article about a new kind of email phishing attack that takes advantage of HTML in emails to hide secrets. Hiding secrets in emails sounds like a good idea, except for when bad actors take advantage of this. How it works is that the CSS knows where each element will be relative to the DOM or document object model, and depending on its location relative to a certain object, it will show hidden messages. They name these hidden messages kobold letters. The Lucha security team found this to be applicable in Mozilla Thunderbird, Outlook on web, and Gmail. At the moment, only Thunderbird has discussed publishing a fix for this at a later time, while well, Microsoft marked the issue as resolved with no plan for resolution, and there has been no reply yet from Google. Collabs have always led to awesome things like Charlie XCX and Sophie or Ben and Jerry. Recently, Proofpoint Threat Research collabed with Team Simaru S2 Threat Research on a write-up about the newly discovered Latrodectus malware and email threats they discovered. The main users of the tool are threat actors known as initial access brokers, which mean they sell access to computers which they were first to get into. Based on functionality and characteristics of the newly discovered Latrodectus, they believe it to be created by the same developers of the Iced ID malware. Originally seen used in November of 2023 by a group titled TA577, named specifically as such in the write-up, and I assume means Threat Actor 577, this group eventually stopped using it and reverted back to the well-known Picabot. Now it has been picked up by TA578 and is delivered to victims via a copyright infringement legal threat email. This leads to receivers to click on fake websites that has them install JavaScript, which kicks off the install process. The write-up specifically comments that TA578 has switched from their normal initial access payloads to exclusively using Latrodectus. The initial malicious script collects relevant information about the system, including present API functions, debuggers, OS info, processes running, and etc. And it will attempt to install itself if not present, set an auto run key, and create persistence on the system. Like in the case of Iced ID, Latrodectus is designed to send the registration information in a post request to the C2 server, where the fields are HTTP parameters stringed together and encrypted, after which it awaits further instructions from the server. Due to the similarities to Iced ID, the researchers at Proofpoint were able to apply their investigation techniques to uncover more about the original Iced ID campaign. These similarities include C2 hosts, sharing known jump boxes, and connecting to known Iced ID backend infrastructure. In late 2023, Proofpoint researchers used the FNV1A hashing algorithm to brute force Iced ID bot campaign IDs, which allowed insight and correlation to campaigns and aid in confident attribution of previously suspected threat actor activity. The numbers used in the campaign IDs resolved to words and brands that were used specifically by Iced ID affiliates. This was the first time researchers had observed the successful derivation of the campaign IDs and the strings resolved were notable. The report has included indicators of compromise, so please be sure to update your rulings accordingly. This week, VX Underground shared that security researcher Jonas Like discovered a new string that when pasted into Discord will cause the app to crash. It will not crash the receivers of the message, but only you. It actually doesn't even send the message. It just crashes the app. So technically, it can be seen as a self-DOS, if you will. I actually tried it earlier on stream, and even pasting the message in the Discord chat will cause the application to completely freeze. I had to completely shut down the process on my computer. Vulnerabilities were found in the D-Link NAS devices. The issue is that D-Link has no intention of fixing the vulnerable hardware. In late March, GitHub user NetSecFish published a GitHub repo outlining and demonstrating a malicious HTTP GET request targeting the NAS that causes backdoor access through username and password exposure, as well as have the ability to inject commands. This vulnerability affects D-Link NAS devices models DNS 340L, DNS 320L, DNS 327L, and DNS 325. Turns out that in the NAS underscore sharing CGI URI contained in the NAS hardware, there are hard-coded credentials as well as non-escape system parameters. NetSecFish estimates that there are over 92,000 devices that are connected to the internet that are vulnerable to this attack. After becoming aware, D-Link published an advisory of their awareness of this exploit. However, they don't plan on fixing the issue. 
This exploit affects legacy D-Link products and all hardware revisions, which have reached their end of life or EOL slash end of service life, EOS life cycle. Products that have reached their EOL slash EOS no longer receive device software updates and security patches and are no longer supported by D-Link. D-Link US recommends that D-Link devices that have reached EOL slash EOS be retired and replaced. Regardless of product type or sales channel, D-Link's general policy when products reach EOS slash EOL, they can no longer be supported and all firmware development for these products cease. Looking at the numbers, these are clearly much older devices. The most recently supported hardware's EOS was May of 2020, meaning that these devices are at minimum four years out of date. But what do you think? Do you think four years is fair for a hardware company? I think about what Sonos tried to do in 2019 by bricking old speakers so users would be forced to upgrade their hardware, but we actually just passed the 10 year anniversary of the last official Windows XP update, which happened on April 8th, 2014. However, that didn't stop Microsoft from releasing post-retirement patches. Last week, we chatted about consortiums and Leo underscore Warren reminded me of the W3C, World Wide Web Consortium, who support the development of web standards and accessibility. I totally forgot about the W3C Consortium. However, in college, I used to walk by their space in the status center at MIT. While everyone was kind of making comments about my name last week, so many of the comments were actually encouraging and welcoming, way more than usual. So thank you so much for allowing me to grow into this role and I really appreciate it. As I said in last week's video's comments, we're currently making some optimizations to the process of producing ThreatWire, so please bear with us if we are occasionally late on an episode. One last ask for y'all. I'm doing another email ask. Are you a startup founder, preferably with users and paying customers? If so, I would love the chance to chat with you about something I'm thinking about. If you could email me at the email linked down below, I'll get back to you and we can schedule a one-on-one. As a reminder, the book club will be starting April 24th. If you want to join, head over to patreon.com slash threatwire. No dog with me this week, but I hope that you enjoyed Threatwire for the week of April 8th, 2024. I'm Allie Diamond, and you can find me everywhere online at Ending with Allie. Good luck, have fun, and don't get caught.